Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the European Volleyball Show. We are back after a break last week, and there is a lot of stuff to cover over the past two weeks. Hope everyone had a good couple weeks here, including Rob. How, how are your weeks? How was your week off? My week off was great, Dan. Thanks. Uh, welcome back. Happy Friday. Uh, good to be back at the show. It's it's cool now that we have so much time before Champions League Super Finals where we can cover everything else that's going on because there's so much. Uh, it's playoff time. It's playoff time in pretty much every league in the world right now. There's a lot of huge, like high profile matches being played, and it's fun to dig into those domestic leagues before we have to start really building hype around the, the super finals for Champions League. So I'm excited about it. Yeah. So, quick uh, recap of what we're going to cover in this episode. Because we still have so much time left for the super finals, we're going to leave the previews for that to uh, next week's episode and the week after. So unfortunately, there's not going to be a lot of uh, Super Finals talk today, but we still have so much domestic league volleyball to talk about because every domestic league is right either in the middle of their playoff season or, or just about you know, at the finals or in the finals. So it's a great time to talk about that, give you guys an update on where we stand in all the leagues because, you know, these, these Champions League teams, it's not just like they just play in Champions League. They're, they're playing uh, in their domestic leagues as well and playing at extremely high level. Yeah, that's right. That I, I'm always fascinated by the overlap of teams between their Champions League seasons and their domestic seasons. And fortunately for the teams that did make the Super Finals and Champions League, they have a good month off to prepare for that. And while they're doing that, they have domestic leagues to go and try to win. So uh, some great matches that we've watched over the last couple of weeks in the early and mid stages of playoffs all over Europe. Yeah, and also at the end of the episode, guys, stick around because we have as you can see uh, on, on the screen, we have a special announcement and a, a special interview for you guys. And, you know, it's not really a secret. You, if you see the thumbnail, you probably know who it is. But uh, stick around for that. But, Rob, uh, let's get right into it here. Which league do you want to start in? How about Italy women? All right, perfect, because I have it loaded up right here. Uh, let's talk about the Italian women's playoffs, who just a couple days ago finished their first uh, game of the semifinals. It's a best of three series. So as you can see on the screen, uh, Caneliano making pretty quick work of Scandici here. That, uh, no surprise there that Conegliano is where they are and no surprise that they started off on a good foot in the semifinals. But remember the Champions League quarterfinal matchup, if I'm correct, where they played Scandici and barely beat them in like a 3-2 crazy five set barn burner. So uh, we've seen that matchup a lot and it's given some great volleyball already this year. Uh, so now it's interesting to see that same thing in a three match series. Yeah, and I feel like, I feel like except for those couple weeks, uh, Caneliano has looked like a different team, uh, looked extremely good in this one. As you can see, a very balanced scoring. It wasn't just the Iganu show. We actually had a lot of balanced scoring between Hill and, and uh, Miriam Silla, who, who's looking good. Uh, I don't know, Scandici, I did expect a little, uh, a little more from them, like you said, uh, playing Caneliano very tight in the Champions League. But as you guys know, it's, it's, it's a different game sometimes between Champions League and, uh, and the domestic leagues. It is. And I remember when we talked about that matchup in Champions League after that five-setter in the quarterfinals that we thought that it could have gone one of two ways for the second leg. It was either Scandici really started believing in themselves in that matchup. They found some confidence. They found some strategic advantages where they might be able to put pressure on Canegliano and that they would come back out in the next match and continue to be that competitive. Or Canegliano would take that very narrow win and say, okay, we, we need to come back a little bit more focused and un understand what we're getting into a little bit more. And sure enough, in the second leg, uh, Canegliano smoked them. I think it was a pretty quick 3-0. So yeah. uh, after after gaining some conf more some additional confidence in that matchup, Canegliano looked to be picking up where they left off in this one. So far, first leg of the semifinals, you're right, uh, best of three series. So a lot of volleyball still to play. Yeah, and just shout out to a couple of regulars, uh, some familiar faces in the chat, Georgie and uh, Sineric. Uh, good to have you guys. Uh, good to see you. Uh, and you know, as always, guys, ask questions. We're reading the chat. We'll we'll try and answer 
uh, as best we can and, and you know, discuss amongst yourselves as well. We love to see uh, the volleyball discussion happening here. Um, and probably the more interesting uh, match here, Rob, was Monza versus Navarra, which was a 3-2 pretty, uh, pretty close match here. We had a couple of close sets in the, in the second and fourth and a, a couple of interesting lineup decisions as well. Yeah, so Navarra beating Monza 3-2. This is a, a great matchup that we actually haven't seen in Champions League or anywhere else because Monza was busy dominating the CV Cup. Um, tell us about the lineup choices, Dan, because we've seen a couple interesting things for both Novara and Monza throughout the year. Uh, Novara has a lot of depth. They can, they can do a lot of different things, but no Hannah Ortman for Monza was very interesting. Yeah, and Hannah Ortman was such a big part of their CEV Cup uh, victory there for Monza, which was a fantastic run by them. And, you know, without her, you had, look at, look at uh, Lise von Heck, the Belgian opposite, having to take 56 attacking attempts in this one. Whereas, wow. you know, oh, whereas, you know Hannah Ortman can be a pretty high usage outside hitter. She's uh, pretty offensively oriented, so that's tough. I mean to take 50, 56, that's like an Aganu or a Boscovich uh, amount of usage. So That's exactly, exactly what I was just about to say. If your name isn't Aganu, Boscovich, Hawk, or someone of that caliber, 56 swings might be a little bit more than is reasonable for your team and your expected level of production. So uh, that is crazy. That's, that's a, lot of, a lot of arm swings. Yeah, and on the other side, we saw uh, another Belgian, Britt Herbutz, on the bench for the uh, Dutch outside hitter, the young, the advanced Nika Dalderop, who is, uh, you know, I feel like she's she's rising through the ranks here a bit and, and really proving herself. This is a big statement to be starting on Novara in the semifinals. We've seen Dalderop a few times come in just in random points and matches throughout this season. And I think she's really good. She's got good size, good ball control, has a really nice arm and some good range. Uh, we talk about the third outside hitter position all the time for these European club teams, men's and women's. It's such an important role because for whatever reason, you might need that person, whether someone gets hurt, someone's not playing very well, someone just needs a break. Uh, to have someone that can come in off the bench and immediately be comfortable and contribute in that in any outside hitter sort of role is a really big asset. And both of these teams put that to the test in this matchup. So whatever happens in the next match, which uh, tomorrow, I believe, uh, yeah, April 10th, um, is going to be really interesting what they do lineup-wise. Yeah, so guys, definitely check out the Italian uh, Women's League playoffs because, as you know, uh, we had three Italian teams out of four in the Champions League semifinals. So it's extremely high level and a, a CV Cup winner, of, co of course, with Monza. So very, very... Uh, high-level teams here and a, a great league to watch. All right, <clears throat> why don't we go to uh, our next league in Turkey? Let's do it. So I have some of the uh, the schedule up on the screen here. As you guys can see, it's it's going to be a fantastic finals here between Vakif Bank and, and Fenerbahce. Hi, you know, Rob, why don't you walk through a little bit of, of how they got here? Sure. First of all, it looks like there's a uh... A match that's live right now as we're talking if for uh, between Nilifer and Aydin um, I'm not familiar with those two teams but they're playing in like the fifth to eighth plates sort of draw and uh, looks like Nilifer is up 2-0 as we speak so there's volleyball happening right now which is kind of cool uh, Fenerbahce beating Ikshasi Basi 3-2 15-12 in the last leg of the semifinals to get to the finals which is which must have been a phenomenal match um, I wasn't watching it, but uh, just the scoreline alone tells me how much fun that must have been to watch. And then, of course, and no surprise to anyone, Vakif Bank Istanbul, uh, their last match against Thai, 25-20, 25-9, 25-15. <laughs> yeah. <Wow>. And, <laughs> and given the way they ended their Champions League run, Vakif Bank obviously participating in the Super Finals as one of the two teams, uh, Canaliano being the other one on the women's side. Uh, you know, and, and Rob, you know me. I've, I've been the the biggest Vakif Bank uh, supporter, like maybe too much at times, but they, they for, for me, are going to be the favorite here in the finals, given the way they play it. Probably the, 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 you might be the biggest Vakif Bank fan <laughs> that isn't Turkish on the planet, Dan. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, maybe. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of their players, their team. Uh, just a quick one in the chat, Sinaric asks, will you discuss transfers at some point? And uh, 
if you guys want us to, but uh, let's, I, I feel like it'd be more interesting for us to do a big episode on that when all of them are official. Uh, but That's yeah. a good point. Yeah, it, it's, it puts us in kind of a tough spot to talk about things that are just rumored. It, it's better to yeah. know for sure that they're happening before we can talk about it. But if you have any questions about things, throw them in the chat. Yeah, I mean, we're, yeah, we're, gonna, we're not discussing rumors on the show, only done deals, but it's, it's, right. you're right, it's, it's starting. There's, there's, a few, uh, there's a few signings already. Um, anyway, Rob, did you get your prediction? Uh, Vakif Bank, uh, Fenerbahce? It's impossible to pick against Vakif Bank. Uh, it's funny because against Busto, our CCO in the Champions League semis, we, we saw like the incredible Busto come back and upset in the first leg, and then Vakif Bank absolutely stomped them into the ground in the second leg. And I mean, not not that Ty put up a fight against them in the first semifinal, but just that that very convincing, like dominant three nothing win is uh, not the first time we've seen that from Bakit Bank this year in a playoff situation. Uh, meanwhile, Fenerbahce, like that Fenerbahce Exashibasi series was amazing. Fenerbahce three nothing, Exashibasi three two, and then Fenerbahce three two to advance. So that is. Great volleyball and just an emotionally draining Shirley series for Fenerbahce. And now <laughs> they get rewarded by a matchup against the seemingly unbeatable Baki Bank starting tomorrow. So uh, that'll be fun to watch. I, I cannot pick against Baki Bank. There's no way I see them losing this series. Maybe Fenerbahce steals a match. I wouldn't even predict that. I think it'll be two matches, a uh, pretty clean Baki Bank domestic win. Yeah, and speaking of Chetsabatsi, they're one of the teams who I'm pretty interested to see how they approach this offseason because, as we saw in that last match, like we were discussing earlier, Tiana Boscovich, 61 attempts. Oh, and my goodness. That's going to be tough on a player like to do that every match, day in, day out. And not saying the rest of the Chetsabatsi is not talented. Obviously, they're very, very good players on the team. But Boscovich, like, is she going to do the same thing on the Serbian national team this summer? It's going to be... And she's one of the players who can handle it, but that's 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 tiring. Anyone at home try she's, she's try one of few and right. Try doing that in practice. It's it's tiring just to do it by yourself. Yeah, she's one of few who can handle that and still like score and be efficient, which we've talked about a, about her a few points this this season. And I know she's young, but but still, Dan, you're right. Like that's that's an exhausting and just physical and like mentally exhausting to depend on her that much. Uh, Basi will be a very interesting off-season team to follow because there's always an arms race in the off-season, of course. Like, we know how it always goes during during transfer time and everybody just chasing Vakif Bank, what they're able to put out on the floor right now. I, I don't know. I don't know what, what a team like Basi is going to be able to do to build around Boscovich to compete at that level. And last question before we move on from Turkey. Rob, you're American. So Jordan Thompson, is she, is she an outside hitter or an opposite next year? I have no idea. That is a great question. Uh, for her own career's sake, it's nice that she has now proven that she can do either. Uh, I've always thought of her as an opposite. I never even thought that she could switch positions until I saw her on Exhaustibasi this year and was confused when I saw her and Boscovich <laughs> on the floor at the same time. But uh, I, I've seen her play a lot of opposite coming out of the NCAA and playing on the American national team when she was barely 20 years old and scoring with the best of them. Like she, she can be an elite player at that position. Or it turns out that if she wants to be like the, the second highest scorer or just any other role, it turns out she can adapt to that too. So I don't know. I don't know where she's going to go next. I don't know what, what position she wants to play. Um, but it's nice that she can do either. Now, it, she might end up having the Ivan Zaitsev problem on Perugia a couple years ago where he wanted to play opposite, but his team needed him to play outside hitter. So there, it's kind of a double-edged sword. If, you could, if you're good at playing both positions, yet you prefer one or the other, or you see your career going with one position versus the other, um, bouncing back and forth might not always be the best thing. So she's an interesting one to follow, and I don't know the answer. Yeah, for sure. And it's, you know, like you see with Matt Anderson, sometimes it helps to be adaptable and you can fit in perfectly in, in different situations where you're needed. Um, Sineric in the chat. He's yes. done, oh, he's done a, good. Anderson has done a very good job balancing the two positions, by the way. He is about as good of an example of that as I can think of, uh, but that is difficult to do. 
Yeah, Sineric in the chat, yeah, about Bosque, the Serbian national team should have a lot more uh, options than Chetsabatsi. Yes, yeah, so a couple of... Uh, Agreed. Yeah, for sure. Good outside hitters and uh, offensive middles on that team as well. All right, let's talk about uh, the Polish Women's League, which just finished their uh, semifinals as well. And, and Rob, I feel like there was a bit of... Uh, there was some... Uh, I don't know what the right word is, but we got... You know, faked out a bit with the Polish regular season because now looking at the finalists and and Voj and uh, or sorry and Rezov and uh, Police, I, f- I feel like that's who we would have expected rather than the standings suggested. Right, it was a little weird because Police was Police made it the farthest out of any Polish team in Champions League, but like Bujeshov was the one seed. They they did get to the finals. They. It took them three matches to beat Łódź, which looked like a really good series. Um, and police had taken care of Radom pretty convincingly. So, yeah, I think we got what we expected, but but getting getting there wasn't necessarily as clean for either team. I'm not totally sure, Dan. I haven't followed the Polish Women's League nearly as much as I think you have. Yeah, well, just some struggles from Police early on. Of course, uh, a lot of it was due to injuries, uh, due to some coronavirus issues as well. But uh, I, th- I think the two best teams in the league are in the finals. And, you know, that, that starts soon. That's going to be very exciting. Rezazov, of course, uh, Canadian opposite, uh, Kiara Van Rijk uh, versus um, a very good uh, opposite on uh, Polici as well, on the Jovana Brakocevic. So battle of some big, big swingers uh, in the Plus Liga finals. Uh, Love Kira Van Rijk. She's having a great year. Uh, there's some there's some very good Canadian women making names for themselves in Europe right now. You yeah. must be loving that. Yeah, and uh, Canadians playing VNL for the first time um, this this year. So I'm very excited about that as well. And the fact that a yeah, few of them are awesome. having good seasons is, is very exciting. All right, the Polish women's. Uh, I guess let's talk about men's for a bit now, Rob. Because uh, they're good. There's some pretty uh, pretty good stuff going on on that side as well. Uh, let's start in Italy, where we just a couple of nights ago um, had the last game of the semifinals between Civitanova and Perugia, and you know the path to the finals was actually not too bad for either of these teams. So that's our final again, Perugia and Lube Civitanova. How many times are we going to see that matchup? Uh, the answer is never enough in my opinion i can watch those teams play a, a, a best out of 99 series not get sick of it um perugia perugia's had an interesting road because they were legitimately challenged by milano in the first round um milano taking a match milano legitimately having a shot at taking the second match um, but when they let that slip away perugia kind of put their foot on their necks in the third match and beat them 3-0 but then Perugia over Monza in the semifinals, absolutely no problem. A uh, quick three three matches won in the best of five series. The more fun series was Lube versus Trentino in the other semifinal. Uh, this had it all. Trentino, of course, are super finalist in Champions League. And now it turns out that they're not even playing for their domestic league finals, which is insane. But there was a moment... I can't remember what ma- which match it was, Dan. You might have to help me out here. Either match two or match three. Uh, Lube won both of them. That uh, Trentino was making a crazy comeback on a service run. And there was one very weird play that a ball was overpassed by Lube against yes. uh, yeah. Nimir's service run. And Alessandro Micheletto, who's been playing great, uh, the ball was coming right at him. It would have... it. I think he should have gone up and hit it on the overpass. At the very least, he should have passed it to get a free ball on the Trentino side. He let it drop. It landed on the sidelines in, and Lube continued to put him away in that match. It it negated a huge run that Trentino was riding all the momentum in the world. And after that play happened, Lube wasn't touched the rest of the series. I don't think Lube dropped a set after that play happened, if I'm remembering correctly. Maybe they, they lost one set for the rest of the series. That play was totally a turning point in my head as I was actually watching all these matches. So that was that was wild. And these two, two, two teams, so good, so evenly matched. Um, different results in Champions League, obviously, but it turns out that we get Lube Perugia again after the Super Cup Finals, the Cup Finals, 
two matchups in the Champions League fourth round. Now we get a best of five series that starts on April 14th. Perugia Lube chapter whatever, six, seven. I don't even know anymore. Yeah, so if, if anyone knows, I know the exact play you're talking about. I remember watching it. If anyone in the comments knows the, the exact moment of that play, uh, yeah, it was a bit of a turning point. And um, I, I feel like it was game two because no Micheletto in game three, which I also believe was a mistake given his performance in game four, which was really strong. He's one of the, the best players on the team. Uh, but yeah, Tr Trentino, yeah, it's, it's funny that they're in the Super Finals and, and not in the Italian League Finals. It just goes to show how competitive these teams are um, at the top. But, but still, Trentino, a fantastic team. Although I, I think Monza was, a, you know, I actually felt, I felt that series was a little competitive. Uh, especially in that, fir that first game, we saw, you know, Zaxa really have to pull, or sorry, not Zaxa, Perugia uh, really have to pull deep, I feel, in that first one. There were a couple tense moments there. Um, yeah, a uh, rising star <laughs> in the volleyball world, for those of you who don't already know his name, is Turkish opposite Adis Lagumzija from Monza. Yes. That dude is an absolute baller. He can just score points. He he might be he might be the second best opposite in the Italian league this year, behind Namir. Uh, yeah, I yeah. I can't think of anybody else that has had a better year than Adis Lagumzija has for Monza. He, in my opinion, is the reason that they made it to the semifinals. That they had the year that they had. I was so impressed by him all year long, and I'm very interested to see what happens with him this off season if he stays there or goes to. A little more of a contender uh that dude is legit 100 percent legit and the first i heard of him dan was from you on your show on five one so uh, you get credit for introducing him to me um yeah well i you know i i got tipped off by someone who said hey there's this young like i feel like he was 17 or 18 years old at the time you know he's, he's gonna change the change the world of turkish volleyball and, and now look at uh, turkey qualified to euro volley 21 you have uh addis Lagumja. Uh, you have his brother, potentially Mirza Lagumja. You have uh, right. Effie Bayram doing a great job as well. So, I'm, I'm, man, Turkey Turkey on the men's side is, is looking to uh, be a lot improved. Um, let's just go through a couple questions here in the chat before we move on to the Russian uh, playoffs. Uh, Brian Zinzer asks, do you think Mackenzie Adams will get a tryout for the national team uh, based on this year's performance, or is she just a result of everyone on her team helping pull blocks? And... Rob, you probably have a, a good, better idea on this, but I'll just go my opinion quick. Um, I talked to Jordan Poulter on the Ace Space podcast a couple of weeks ago, and I've always found, I feel like the U.S. women's national team is probably like the one the most that will give a chance to maybe some players that are a little unexpected. So I think uh, given Mackenzie Adams' pretty strong year, um, and I think you know she will be in the USA national team gym for sure, probably uh, given a pretty good yeah. chance at VNL as well. And then on um, the Olympics is tough in my opinion, but uh, she'll for sure get looks on, on the national team. The, the Olympic look, I, I personally don't think so. I am a hundred percent on board with you, Dan. I think you nailed it. Um, I think a lot of the point that you made about the American national team, women's actually men's too, uh, having, I don't know, they, they feel like they're more willing to give people a look like that who haven't haven't like played with the national team much before or whatever. Um, it started on the women's side with Kim Hill. Uh, her story is crazy. She, of course, Adam's teammate in Canadiana right now, uh, was basically retired from the game of volleyball until she went to an, a, a national team open tryout. And Karch was like, who is, who is this person? And immediately like national team started pretty much right away uh and then on the men's side it was really because of taylor sander coming out in 2014 like straight out of college and winning mvp of the world league the same year that gave both of the coaches on the respective sides in the u.s gym the the freedom to kind of take people and give them a look and you're right uh, mackenzie adams will definitely she is in the gym is like in the pipeline will be spending time with the gym once her season's over in italy um, we'll definitely play VNL. I think it's the beauty of VNL, especially this year, uh, putting it in a bubble, having everyone in the same place, and then using it as just a, a tryout system for Tokyo. Do I think she'll make the Tokyo roster? No, probably not. But she is very much on Karcher's radar. I can confirm that 100%. Yeah, and by the way, guys, as we get closer to the Olympics, we'll probably uh, get get a lot more into that as well and cover the VNL a bit. So 
uh, you know, we're definitely focused on the European teams there, um, but you know, we, we will give a chance to uh, the international volleyball as well. Um, and I, I feel like there's a few things about uh, Poland in the chat. So what, do you want to do that first? Because uh, actually it's probably the most interesting uh, league right now out of, out of all the leagues we're going to talk about today. Yeah, let's do it. So for those of you who haven't been following uh, the Plus Liga, which is the Polish Volleyball League, we had a pretty uh, surprising result. The seemingly unbeatable Zaksa Kedzius and Kozle actually lost to um, Skral Belhotov, which uh, I feel like a lot of people weren't expecting. I, I have to give myself a little credit here. I feel like I've been higher on uh, Belhotov than, than most people. But uh, Rob, did, what did you think of this match, this result? I am happy about this result, <laughs> honestly, because I'm with you. I've, I've been a little higher on Skral than average this year. We've talked about them a lot because of, they they've played with Zaxa a bunch. They played them twice in Champions League. They made it to the quarterfinals before kind of getting stomped by Zen Kazan. Um, but obviously their start to the year wasn't very good. Uh, Taylor Sander didn't play at all until pretty much the new year. Uh, it took them a while to kind of figure themselves out. Uh, Dusan Pekovic has been streaky, um, but they are other than that opposite spot, they're pretty complete. Um, Ibatapur and Taylor Sander are a phenomenal duo of outside hitters. They have great middles in Carol Kloche and Biniak with uh, Huber coming off the bench. Um, I think Kasper Piachowski is really good at, at the libero spot. Uh, Skra's good. Um, I didn't think they were championship good in Poland, but I knew that they weren't a team that anybody was just going to walk over. Uh, they beat uh, Aseka Rosovia 2 0 in the quarterfinals, which uh, Rosovia is actually pretty good. So uh, that was a good sign. I don't know if I saw them beating Zaxa in a match in the semifinals. I knew it would be competitive, but a 3-1 win um, to force game three was a pleasant surprise, in my opinion. So Zaxa, our other Champions League super finalist, is going to have to work pretty hard in one more match, which looks like it's on Sunday, the 11th, um, to reach the finals against Jaszewski, who beat Warsawa 2-0 in a pretty competitive 2-0 series in the semifinals on the other side. Yeah, Rob, you as well as uh, everyone in North America going to have to wake up a little early for that one because it starts at 2.45 uh, European time. And we have a couple of great Ooh, points I, I want to address. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to disagree with you a bit, Rob. I agree with Georgie in the chat who, who points out, yeah, I, for me, and with apologies to our guests at the end of the podcast, I do believe Belhatov on paper is, is the second most talented team in the Plus Liga. And I feel like... I do agree with that. Okay, okay, fair enough. Um, of course, they have the issue of consistency. Maybe, uh, you know, a lot of blame maybe has been placed on low match and by hot seat. Um, and we have the issue that Taylor Sander and Milada Badapur can never have a good game at the same time, which is <laughs> the same time. It's, it's so <laughs> yeah. bizarre. I can't believe it. And of course, we have to get to the biggest story pointed out a couple times in the chat as well. That's uh, uh, Zaxa was missing Pavel Zatorski. Um, which is a huge blow. And if, you know, this is a good example, <laughs> if anyone's doubting, uh, doubting the importance of top liberos, he, the, I feel like the, their team looks very different without Satorsky. He is incredibly important to Zaxa. Uh, we've got a top 10 video on this channel coming out very, very soon with uh, Zaxa's top 10 plays of Champions League so far. Uh, Zatorski is all over that. He mm. is... The, the defensive plays that he's able to make are ridiculous, but I think more important even is serve receive. There is a ton of chemistry that's very important between the, the serve receive unit of three players on a team. Now, not just Zaxa with any team. The two receiving outside hitters and the libero really have to know one another well in how to handle balls that are short, that are deep, and that are in between seams. That's really important. And that comes with just a lot of repetitions. So when one of those three is replaced, um, it, that, that area of the game can suffer a little bit. And uh, we talk about Zox's offense being so good out of system, but still they need to be able to spread the floor. They need to be able to run things fast in order to really score points at their top efficiency. So uh, yeah, losing Zatorski is no joke. So I don't know. I don't know the nature of his injury. I don't know what the timetable is on his return, but it's definitely something that Zox is going to have to battle through. 
Yeah, for sure. And I mean, that's uh, this game was still close at the end of the day. This easily could oh, have yeah. gone uh, two sets going to overtime in this one, especially 31 29 first set. So even without Zatorsky, it's not like Kazuzhin uh, Kozhle uh, rolled over or anything. Um, but yeah, I mean, it could go either way on Sunday. I, I'm definitely, that is out of any match we're going to talk about, probably the, probably the must watch match because uh, you know, just the storylines behind it are so interesting in terms of. Uh, Kajuzhin Kozle and they're, they're maybe the best season of any Polish team. Yeah, but if they don't <laughs> win the Polish league, like, that's, that's what I mean. There's the, a lot of stakes. That's There's a lot of say. stakes. The, the, yeah, the, the pressure is totally on them. I, I completely agree. They have dominated the Plus Liga all year long. They have by far been the best team in their respective league of any team that we've talked about so far this show, other than Canegliano, in my opinion. And if, if they failed to even make the finals, that would be an incredible storyline. Yeah, so exactly. Stakes are high. Um, before we move on to the Russian League, let's uh, address a question because, you know, we, loved, we love to hear you guys in the chat. Uh, Risto asks, do you think Perugia is lacking in the opposite position? Uh, it seems they're relying a lot on Leon, uh, meaning that if Leon doesn't play well, the team is never going to win. Ooh, and that's, I mean, that is the question. You nailed it, Risto. <laughs> that, that is the question with Perugia. Um, I wonder how many times we've answered this exact question, but it's worth talking about again. Uh, Dan, you've done a great job addressing that on different podcasts throughout the internet. I've mentioned it before, too. This show, it's so important for Perugia to have one other guy other than Wilfredo Leon. The reason why they've been so good, even before Wilfredo Leon got there, is because of the play of Alexander Atanasievich. He has been absolutely crucial to that team's success for his entire time there. He's been there a long time, three, four, maybe five years. And with coming off of his injury, we've seen all year long that he is obviously not his normal self. So much so that Heinen has stopped even bothering putting him on the court. Uh, there, there was a while there where he could start every match and get pulled after half a set or a set and now that doesn't even happen anymore now he 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 knows that he's not really going to see the court at all so they brought in Masie Mujai that hasn't worked um they have Shawan Vernon Evans on the roster he hasn't seen the court at opposite at all which Dan and I agree is a mistake uh, so it's pretty much been strictly Teister Horst who's not really even natively an opposite so for all of the struggles Perugia has had, and I've been very critical of their center position all year long, um, I think fundamentally it comes down to that to that exact thing, that they have been so lacking at the opposite position. And not that Terhorst has had a bad year. He's been fine for the fact that he's not like playing in his normal position. But there's a level of production that Perugia needs and that they're used to, that they just have not had this year because uh, Atanasievich has been so much less than 100% that's put a different amount of pressure on Wilfredo Leon than he's used to. Um, and not that he can't handle that, but we've seen a couple uncharacteristically subpar games for Leon this season that we haven't seen in previous years, just because I feel like he's having to reach a little bit more than he ever has to produce all of his team's points. So great point. Uh, it's been brought up a lot. It's worth talking about again, and it will be probably the story of the finals in Italy, depending on how it goes. Yeah, I mean, just quickly, I have a bit of a different take, I think. I think if uh, Leon plays bad, they're going to lose anyway. So why not set him yes. 10, 10 to 12 times a set? I, I don't think there's any downside. I think you run the offense through him and Sole when he's in the front court. And that's what you're going to have to do. There's no other way to beat this Lube team. I think that's... If Leon, if he plays poorly, there's, just, there's no way they can win relying on the other players. Um, that's a great point yeah they're that is who Perugia is as a team they score points by going on crazy service runs uh, they've got Plotnitschke for that they've uh two horses have a pretty good serving year even Travica can serve pretty well and then Leon and if they you're right Dan I, I don't hate them just dishing the ball to Leon all the time anyway because you're going to need to ride him to to win this championship no matter who else is on the court with you so yeah I don't, I don't hate that move. I think it's clearly Perugia's recipe for success. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, and uh, Risto, you know, before we move on here, uh, makes a great point, of course. Uh, 
very, a very correct point. <laughs> uh, asking about Shawan uh, Vernon Evans. Why haven't we seen him? Not going to talk about it, just agreeing that uh, it's, it's a little confusing. Um, okay, let's move on to the Russian League, unless there's anything more you want to say about Yastrebshi versus uh, Versava. Um, unfortunately, I, I, I haven't watched any of that series. I've I've watched just a little bit of Yastrzemski this year. Like we didn't get to see him in Champions League, unfortunately, because they had to drop out of the fourth round. But here they are, like second seed, holding seed, haven't lost a match yet in playoffs, uh, coming in a little bit under the radar, but comfortably in the finals. I they're very worthy of talking about and uh, a preview again to our our special guests at the end of the show. Yeah, we'll get some more Yastrzemski talk at the end of the video. So if you want some uh, some inside, insider information on that, stick around. Yeah, just uh, it's too bad. My my only thing takeaway from the series: Bartosz Volek had a fantastic season in the Plus League. Unfortunately, uh, maybe a minor injury, something going on. He kind of tailed off uh, in this series, which is you know again they they needed him to play well. He was such an integral part of the team. Um, let's yeah, go to Russia. Agreed. Let's go to Russia. Okay. So Russia is an interesting one because the format is so different. Um, Russia this year, first of all, I think there's a match that's still going on live as we speak. Let me see. Yeah, how's yes, that match yes, going? Can you give us an yes, update there here, is. Rob? Yes, I can. So before we talk about everything else that's going on, there is a match right this second happening of the semifinals between Kuzbas Kemerovo and Zenit St. Petersburg. Uh, Kemerovo up two sets to one. Uh, Zenit St. Petersburg up 23-22 in set four. So that is a crazy match that uh, if anybody finds a way to watch it, go watch it right now. It's on. It's live right now. Uh, ZSP just went up 24-22. So that one might be going five. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty uh, pretty exciting match here. That's uh, So anyone who's watching that, you know, have us on one screen, have them on the other one. <laughs> Um, Love but, that. But I guess the another huge story of the past week. Uh, unfortunately, it's a negative story. It's uh, Zenit Kazan uh, being eliminated from Russia. So it's, this is crazy that we don't have a Zenit Kazan team to watch right now because they're so much a part of our lives <laughs> in uh, April and May. Yes, and, they are. And now they're out of Russian League playoffs and out of Champions League. What, how, what, how did this happen, Rob? Well, first of all, about their Champions League journey, uh, I think people are just going to look at the results and say that they didn't make the finals. First of all, uh, by the way, Zenit St. Petersburg just won set four. So we are indeed going to five between them and Kemerovo. Uh, oh. Zenit Kazan was unbelievably close in the Champions League semis. They lost, was it 16-14 in a golden set? Like they, Both matches went to five. Both of them went to extra points in game five. The The margin for the, the Champions League matches it was as slim as it gets. So... Uh, you, you got to look just past the fact that they lost in the semifinals to see how, and there, it could not possibly have been closer between them and Zaxa. So that's worth mentioning. Uh, but in Russia, it's they've been so streaky. They had that one period where they were terrible, losing like seven in a row or seven of eight or whatever it was. And then they came back with an equally impressive winning streak. And we've talked about Russia a lot this year being as deep and, and as competitive as it's ever been. Uh, the teams that made the final six, and we'll talk about the format in just a minute, uh, are phenomenal. All six of those teams that had a chance to go to the semifinals and the finals are incredibly good teams, like a better top six in Russia than there's probably ever been, at least in my memory. So Zenit Kazan, I think, is used to having pretty much only one or maybe two other teams to really race with to go to the finals and win in Russia. And this year, that was just not the case. They couldn't afford that losing streak that they went on in the regular season um, because Russia was that much more competitive. So they did beat Fakal Novi Uruguay, I think, yesterday, or maybe today in a fifth place match. Uh, but yeah, failing to make the semifinals for, I feel like, the first time in forever. You're right. We're so used to just relying on Zenit Kazan to be a championship contender all the time. Yeah, and, and like you said, they were so, I mean, I feel like people are going to look back on the season 10 years and be like, oh, Zenit Kazan was terrible. But like you said, they, that was probably the closest series of Champions League I've ever seen between uh, Kajiric and Kojle and, um, and Zenit Kazan. And also exactly. two, two five-setters <laughs> in their final six group against Novosibirsk and Kuzbas Kemerovo. So, you know, they're barely not qualifying here as well. 
a crazy, crazy close season. And, you know, they, they also were making some lineup decisions. Here we saw a little bit of, um, sorry, uh, Fedor Voronkov, I believe, uh, a little bit, or am I thinking of, uh, anyway, we, we, yeah, we saw uh, mm -hmm. some replacements in for uh, Irvin Angapet and Bartosz Bednor is at various points. Uh, wh what do you think about that? Uh, we saw it in the end of Champions League as well, where Voronkov came yeah, in for Bednarz and played phenomenally well. But I think the storyline is more about Bednarz getting benched than it is about Voronkov playing well. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, Bednarz is going to have a very interesting offseason, both in where he fits in the Polish national team scheme and what his club situation is for next year. Because last club season, he or the last full club season, he was so good. In, uh, in Modena, he was absolutely phenomenal. And it just hasn't quite been the same uh, for Zeni Kazan this year. He's been great at times. He has not been good at others. Uh, we another, Again, the third outside hitter position on a European club team being very, very important for several reasons. Um, really quick, I want I wanted to show you or like go over Zenit Kazan's last few match results. <laughs> okay. Okay, this is ridiculous, <laughs> absolutely ridiculous. So going back to the, let's go back to the quarterfinals of Champions League. So they placed Krab Belkatov, they beat him three sets to one, then they beat him three sets to two in uh, to advance. Now that they only needed to win three sets or two sets at that point. So that five setter you can kind of overlook. Uh, they beat Novgorod in Russia three, nothing easily. Then, Champions League semifinals, losing to Zaxa after being up two sets to none, they lose 29-27, 25-22, 16-14, game five to lose the match. They then beat Krasnoyarsk easily in the Russian playoffs. They play Zaxa again. They win in five sets, 20 to 18, game five, but they lose a golden set, 15-13. Then they're, uh, they beat Krasnoyarsk again. They... But like Dan said, their their matches in the round of six in Russia, 15-13 lost to Novosibirsk in five, 15-13 lost to Kemerovo in set five again. Like the amount of two point set five or golden set losses that Zenit Kazan has had in the past month must be an all time high. It's absolutely insane the number of close matches that they've been in and somehow they've managed to lose pretty much all of them. It, it honestly might just be bad luck uh, that that happens. But looking on this Zenit Kazan season as a failure, I don't think is entirely fair. But we do really expect them to contend for championships all the time. We're just used to that. And it just hasn't gone that way this year. But it is definitely worth looking at the manner in which that has happened, just how close all of those matches have been. Yeah, you got to keep context in the play, for some reason, the one play that stands out to me so much is, I think it was the first game of the Champions League against Zaxica, Juj and Kujle, where... exactly the play that you're going to say. Where it was, the exactly third, it was the third set. They had uh, match points, and Buko sets, uh, I think, a shoot to, um, to a Volkov. Volvich, and he gets Volvich, sorry, Volvich. straight down. Yeah, and yep. he gets... Kohanovsky commits 100% to the set read, and... Uh, Angapet is cheering so he doesn't cover the ball and 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 that, that was it that was it that was a that play changed everything about European volleyball this year uh Dan you're exactly right it was I think 25 24 Kazan in set three of the first leg of Champions League semifinals they were already up two sets to none uh they get a free ball yeah. to win the match and Butko to Volvich is stuffed absolutely straight down by a complete commit by Jakob Kokonovsky. Uh, you're exactly right. That was a season-changing play. That play changed the entire landscape of European volleyball this year. Because who knows what happens in the rest of Champions League and in like all of the domestic leagues. Like That, that play really changed everything. Who knows what impact that's going to have on transfers, on national team season. Like That one play was monumentally important in all of European volleyball this year. So that I agree was, if there's one play that I can think about Kazan's year, that's the one. That, that was the opportunity that they just had to have. 
Yeah, for sure. And I'll just let's go through a couple of the comments we made during that uh, that session there. Uh, yeah, as people pointed out, yeah, Navasabrisk uh, did not look great. Uh, against Trentino, but again, like people pointed out, they're missing a few players. Most importantly, in my opinion, uh, their setter, Konstantin Abeyev, who, who I think has been a big part of their success. And also, I think, uh, I think Georgie said they, they don't have a star. But I, I, I kind of disagree. I think uh, draws in Lubrich with the way he's playing right now. I would consider him a star. He's leading the league in aces. He's playing unbelievably well, scoring a lot of points very efficiently. So, uh, I don't know. Draws and Lubrich, is he a star for you? He's close. Uh, I think he's getting towards that level. I, I like that Novosibirsk spent both of their foreigner spots on Serbian uh, with Marko Izovic there as well. Lubrich is a name that everybody watching is going to have to know because given Alexander Atanasievich's health, there's a chance that you won't see him very much for Serbia this summer. Like, who knows? And Lubrich is in prime form. He's had a great year in Russia. Um, he's likely going to be the guy at opposite for Serbia this summer. So that's a name that you're going to have to know if you don't already. Uh, is he a star? Not quite. He's not not quite like superstar level for me. Uh, I think he's the most important player on Novosibirsk, and he doesn't have a phenomenally good game scoring. You're right, they, may, they might not be successful, but missing their setter is important. I've been impressed with Konstantina Bayev this year. That's a great point. Yeah, I was trying to pull up that play here. Unfortunately, uh, video not working uh, there. So let's move on. But yeah, uh, Zenek is on. That's, that, that's what I love about sports. You know, you can't write the story with the ball in the air. You got to wait till it goes in, goes out. And it's, it's a game of, uh, you know, centimeters at this level. So well said. So the, the semifinals, uh, to, to update the matches live, St. Petersburg up six to five in set five right now. So that match is really coming down to the wire. Um, the other semifinal, Dinamo Moscow versus Novosibirsk uh, Moscow. Let's, let's see the, the round of six results because they kind of run their playoffs a little bit like VNL because the VNL has a final six and then they play two pools of three around Robin and the top two of each advance to the semifinals, which I actually kind of like. It's more volleyball. I think it's kind of cool. So Dinamo Moscow beating Fakonovi Urengoy 17-15 set five, uh, which was a crazy match. Um, Moscow also beating Zenit St. Petersburg three sets to one. Uh, we already talked about Kemerovo beating Kazan 15-13 set five. Kemerovo also beating Novosibirsk 3-1 in that stage. Let's see. Novosibirsk, Zenit Kazan we already talked about. And ZSP beating Fakel 3-1 as well. So there were a lot of really, really good matches in that stage. No 3-0s. There were zero 3-0s in that entire round robin stage. So uh, that, that format kind of proving itself just right there with those results, if you ask me. And I, I found it really fun to watch the three games in a row. It kind of reminded me of the uh, Champions League bubbles this year with uh, pretty much the exact same format. Yeah, uh, those are awesome. It's just a whole day or weekend full of volleyball of the same teams. I'm a huge fan of that format. Yeah, and it means you can just focus in, laser in on this one particular set of teams for, for, for a little while. And, I, and I, yeah, I find it a really fun way to watch volleyball as well. And, and Rob, you're just going to have to give us like a, a bell or a ring or something when uh, when this game, uh, Russian League game, uh, is over. But in the meantime... I'm watching. I'm following okay. along. <laughs> in the meantime, let's, uh, you know, the leagues we just talked about, they're not the only leagues. Uh, let, you want to give a brief overview of, of, of how we're doing in, uh, in Germany and France? Sure. So German finals just started yesterday. Uh, the Berlin Recycling Volleys and Friedrich Schaff and the two finalists... Uh, Berlin with an incredible comeback from down two sets to none. They end up forcing set five and winning it in 1917. So a crazy good match in the first leg of the finals. That is a best of five series. So a lot more volleyball to come in Germany. Uh, the semifinalists, Duren had a really good year. Uh, Lundberg had a really good year losing to Friedrichshafen. So congratulations to those teams. Um, Berlin, of course, uh, Champions League Quarterfinalist uh, Friedrich Schaffen very well could have been a Champions League quarterfinalist had they not been hit with COVID in the second leg of the fourth round. So really good volleyball being played there. I'm excited about that series. And I think that's about all there is to say about that for the moment. <laughs> well, pretty good start. I mean, a 1917 five setter uh, with, oh. a, with a lot of subs, a lot of back and forth. Uh, yeah, so again, like it's crazy amount that Europe is, is you know, has so many leagues that have teams like this just playing at a high level. It's, uh, it's, it's really amazing to watch. 
how many different countries have have really fun leagues. And uh, shout outs to Ben Patch and Cody Kessel, both uh, Americans making a big impact on Berlin in that match. Uh, Kessel coming off the bench and playing rock solid at an outside hitter spot for Berlin. That's kind of been a revolving door this year. So that was really cool to see. And uh, Ben Patch was a baller yesterday. Um, you know that if he plays that well, if if, if, he, if you get a really good Ben Patch match, it's usually pretty spectacular. Yeah, he is an absolutely X factor player. Like if if he's totally. if, if he's playing that well, any team he's on is is very dangerous because he 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 remind, he's just one of those players that you know when he when he has a really good uh, spike, I'm just like, why can't you do that every time? It looks so easy. <laughs> totally, he really does make it easy sometimes. Uh, nine six St. Petersburg over Camarovo set five right okay. now. By the way. All right. Wow. Uh, yeah, Risto, you're, you're probably watching the vi mm -hmm. the video I'm pulling up here. Yeah, Joe Worsley. He has gotten a lot of time actually uh, in Future Schaffen this year, but I think Dejan Vicic, who's a fantastic uh, player in his own right, there's no shame in, in being benched to Vincic. But yeah, he's a uh, he's a little bigger, a little more experienced, and, and he has been the starter mostly. Yeah, Worsley did come off the bench in the semis against Lundberg and led a crazy comeback, ended up winning MVP at one of the, the clinching match in the semifinals. So that was really impressive. Huge Joe Worsley fan. Shout out to them and the Out of System podcast. Fantastic content. Fantastic content. Totally. Um, Give them a follow. 10-7 St. Petersburg. All right. Uh, in the women's finals, we have Dresden versus uh, Stuttgart. Of course, Stuttgart being led by the dynamic Crystal Rivers who's another uh, contender for the Team USA gym, in my opinion, given the way she's playing. Uh, Stuttgart beating Schwerin uh, in three matches. F funny enough, it was 3-0 in all matches, which uh, it's kind of funny to see. And then, yeah, that's uh, odd. And then Dresden or Dresder uh, playing them in the finals, which starts on the 10th, which is tomorrow. So definitely check out the uh, German women's playoffs as well. And for our last playoff talk before we... Uh, before I move on here, I think it's going to be France, right? And by the way, guys, if you have any questions, uh, probably best to get them in now before we go over to the special segment. Uh, just a heads up. Yeah, yeah. Throw our questions in the chat. Uh, France just starting their playoffs on the men's side. I actually don't even think they've started them on the women's side yet, which no. is crazy. I'm not sure why their calendar is a little bit behind the other leagues. But this league, the French league, top to bottom this year, has been as tight and competitive as any league in the world. There is no really clear favorite. Uh, I would I, I would pick Montpellier, the the one seed who's had the best year so far. But it's not like they're gonna sleepwalk to the finals or win the championship easily or anything. There are so many really good teams in France, but the story for me is Cambrai. Uh, Cambrai beating Narbonne three nothing in the first leg of the quarterfinals. Cambrai in their first season in French League A, they were promoted from last year from the B League, making the playoffs in their first season and winning their first playoff match. Uh, one of the best and not talked about enough Cinderella stories in all of volleyball this year. A uh, huge shout out to Mike Marshman, American play in middle for them. Um, Cambrai is playing great. They are a very, very good team. And if they make the semifinals, it would be an all time story, a team in their first season in the top league going that far would be just an incredible story. Not being talked about enough, in my opinion. And yeah, if you just look at the uh, name comparisons between the two teams, I mean, Nicolas Uriarte, the uh, legendary Argentinian setter. You have uh, Simon Hirsch, the starting or second opposite of the German national team, uh, Lissandra Zanotti, so Martin Ramos. So there's some uh, there's some big names on our bone, and you're right, the three nothing. Uh, and Rob, this is, for me, this is a pretty... A uh, new story, uh, so that's uh, that's pretty interesting. Do you th so you think they have what it takes to to go the distance? And is there any player on the team that's uh, you know people are underrating and one of the reasons why they're doing so well? Both good questions. Um, I need to watch. Oh, I'm definitely watching this match tomorrow. I'm not sure what time it's at, but the second leg is tomorrow over in Oban. Um it, it, It's sort of worth talking about. I, I wish I could speak for more of the players. I, I've watched them some, probably not enough to. To give a really well informed take, so get me on next week's show after I watch some more, and I'll, I'll, I'll be smarter about that. But the, to talk about the other quarterfinals, uh, Khan won nothing up on Turquan, but uh, three two in the first game. That was that was very competitive. Uh, Chaumont and Tours is a really good series. Uh, Chaumont winning the first three two, and Montpellier beating Poitiers pretty easily three nothing. So uh, Montpellier. 
been the best team so far. Your boy Ryan Sclater having a phenomenal year at opposite. No, my boy, uh, my boy Danny Demianenko. Danny Demianenko having a really good year. Him and Nikola Legoff, like that is a middle duo, man. That is a good middle duo. Yeah, for those of you guys who don't know, Danny Demianenko is fun to watch because he's probably the shortest middle blocker playing at this level. Uh, super athletic, very uh, good wingspan. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 if any short middles out there need a good example of, of how to play, he's a he's a he's a great example of that. Got to shout out Taylor Averill, uh, American middle blocker, who's having an all time great season, uh, hitting, blocking, serving. The fact that he's been able to win several match MVPs as a middle blocker really should tell you all you need to know about the year that he's having. So, big shout outs to him. Uh, very happy to see him have so much success this year. Yep. Uh, okay. So if there's nothing left French, we can answer a few of these questions. Um, Linus Weber. Uh, yeah, I think, I think he's going to be upgraded, un unfortunately, for Friedrich Schaff, and I think he's, he's probably good enough to play a bigger role in one of the, uh, the first three leagues we talked about. Very physical guy. Uh, you know, I feel like we've heard about him for a few years. He's been really uh, closely mentored. And yeah, we're, they're seeing the results. They're seeing the hard work being... Uh, the hard work he put in, you know, and he's, he's looking really good, a lot more technical. I feel like this was the year that his technical ability matched the obviously really high athleticism. Agreed. Uh, Zenit, Zenit Suits Petersburg, by the way, 14 10 set five. So they are on the verge of beating Kemerovo All right. in the semifinals. <laughs> May have jinxed them there. We'll see. Uh, 14 10. It's not over yet. Well, what did you say? You, you can't call the ball in the air. You got to wait until yeah, exactly. it's either in or out or on the floor or whatever. Um, another, sorry, another quick one, another player I want to shout out, uh, Marek Sotola, who's been a very good player on the Czech uh, national team, playing the opposite position, done great for this Czech team that's done very well at youth competitions and has played a, a pretty good role for Poitiers at, at times this season. And I think a guy you're going to need to watch on your radar during Euro volleys is uh, Marek Sotola. Agreed. Yeah, the, the Czech team is underrated. Uh, there are some good players in the Czech Republic. Yeah, with so, Zavaronik uh, as well, I think. Uh, right. Zavaronik had a great year for Monza. He was huge for them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> username says, I thought he meant Cambrai now recruited Lanza for Monza for the end of the league. Uh, what, Rob, what do you think about that? <laughs> very, very interesting. <laughs> yeah. That uh, I, honestly, it's funny because Philippe Lanza actually might fit phenomenally well in France, just in play style. Yeah, actually, that's I can, true. I can totally actually, see but, that. <laughs> Yeah, he, should, he actually probably should should do that. If only it wasn't so valuable to uh, to be. Oh, sorry, you meant Shoman, not uh, not Cambria. I mean, it's even still, it, you're right. It's it's invaluable. Like you can't you can't describe how important it is to be Italian and play in the Italian league. Uh, but yeah, play style wise, I think it would make sense. Um, Rob, do you have any comments on the Belgian or Turkish uh, playoffs? Uh, I do, if you can give me a chance to pull up the results really quickly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's, look at, let's look at Belgium. There's a lot going on there. So it looks like Masaik and Rosalera are in the finals. Is this the finals I'm looking at or the semis? This is the finals. Okay. Well, they're tied 1-1 in matches. Uh, Masaik taking the first 3-1 and Rosalera the second 3 nothing. So... Those two teams are good. Uh, we saw Rosalaire do some serious, like, spoiler-style damage in Champions League fourth round, beating Modena out of pretty much nowhere. And uh, Masaic had a great run in the CEV Cup, as I recall. Yeah, they did. Yeah, they uh, got, got fairly far. I mean, that controversial, I guess, game against uh, Zenit St. Petersburg, who we're ah, seeing. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the game. Um, so that's going to be uh, interesting. Uh, that match in Russia, by the way, is over. 15-11, St. St. Petersburg wins set five to beat Kemerovo in the first leg in the semifinals. So there you go. By uh, The team that, that beats uh, Kemerovo might be in the Russian finals. Almost lost to Masaic in the CV Cup. That's kind of an interesting... <laughs> That's uh, true. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. The top two Belgian teams are always, uh, are always fairly competitive. And a player who we're seeing, I feel like, a lot recently is uh, a very young Belgian setter, Liam McCluskey. We also saw a little bit in the CV Cup. Uh, you know, someone who knows more about the Belgian national team might know more, but he's for me, he seems like uh, he could be playing a, a role on the national team sooner rather than later. Yeah, this this is where people, well-educated people in the chat come in to help us out about their respective countries. This yeah, is one of the things I love about this. We're show. covering a lot of volleyball here, guys. Sorry if we're not uh, we're not uh, too too in depth with your uh, particular team, but uh, we're. We're trying to cover as much ground as we can here. Um, 
I'm looking at Turkish men's. Uh, it looks like Zirat Badkashi beat Galatasaray in the semifinals, two matches to none. So they are in the finals where they will play the winner between Fenerbahce and Arkas Izmir, who are tied 1-1. So that third match, I think, is starting right about now. All right, guys, really finish cool. the yeah. show. Go yeah, watch just, some Turkish volleyball. Go watch some uh, Go watch some Belgian volleyball. Uh, starts in... Starts in about an hour. Uh, Fenerbahce versus Arkas Izmir um, in the final match of that semifinal leg to go to the finals. So if you can find a way to watch that, uh, you should. A lot of Canadians in both those teams, if I'm not mistaken, right, Dan? Uh, Got a little Luke, Graham Vigras. Vigras, Hogue. Uh, Nick Hogue. Is, uh, sorry, what's his name? Brett Walsh, is he? Is that Brett Walsh's team, Arkas Izmir? No, Brett Walsh is on, uh, on Hawk Bank, I believe. Oh, you're right, the other Ankara team. But... Georgie, man, I feel like me and Georgie agree on a lot. Tanisov is the next big star. For sure, he's so fun to watch, unbelievably athletic, going to be a huge role on the Bulgarian national team this summer. We just wrote an article about him, by the way, guys, on C, uh, so check out uh, cev.eu if you want to read a little bit more about Martin Atanasov. Um, yeah, Zirat Bankasi is good. We saw the series between them and Milano in the CEV Challenge Cup, both five setters that were phenomenally fun to watch, so... Uh, Ziyad Bankasi is legit, and I agree about Atanasov. Uh, Georgie, of course, a Bulgarian, loves Atanasov playing at this high of a level. Um, yeah, they, really fun to watch. Good player. Yes, um, I believe there's a question earlier about um, what you like. What do you, what you like better, final six in Russia or a best of series? Ooh, tough call. It depends on what stage of the tournament you're talking about. Um, Because it's really fun to see a series of matches. Uh, Like, we see it in North American sports a lot. Like, in in the NBA, Dan, you see playoff series that are best of five or best of seven games. It's it's cool to see teams play against each other over and over again, like in home and away fashion, just to see how they adjust to one another and how that goes night in and night out. But I also really like the, the whole, like, pool of three round robin thing where you just get to get three teams in a spot and watch them play against each other throughout a weekend or whatever it is, a a VLA model, by the way, that we use a lot for the Volleyball League of America. I don't know. I don't know which one I would pick. Uh, I think for the finals, it's obviously got to be a best of series. Uh, For the semis, it's probably got to be a best of series. But I would like to see more leagues try the the final six thing. Instead of having eight teams make the playoffs and play just a traditional bracket, I kind of like the final six thing. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm not a big fan of it in the VNL personally. I like having okay. those uh, those series and semifinals matches. Or yeah, I don't know. Um, but after seeing it in Russia this year, I don't know. It was it was pretty good, but I feel like it should be maybe a little even earlier. But uh, yeah, I'm more of a fan of traditional series. I would say. How about how about this? What what if there was some kind of group stage to fill the last couple playoff spots? Like give give the top four or six teams a bye and have maybe six teams play for the seven and eight spots in the bracket. Well, how would you? Yeah, that? I like that. The th- the thing that I just hate is um, when you have pointless games right you know at the end of a really good tournament. So you have like yeah oh a, a team already qualified so they play their starters and like yeah so you have a game between like Brazil and like uh, Russia but it's it's not the real game because they've already qualified or already been eliminated. That is. is my least favorite thing in big tournaments. That I agree with, 100%. It, it has worked out well in the, in the Russian Final Six this year, just with the way the results went out. But it, there was a chance that you would have had one match that didn't matter. And I agree, that's that's not ideal. Um, username asks, what do, you, do you have any news about VNL? That's uh, FIVB property, not CEV. But we're, I'm very excited to watch all the uh, European teams because I feel, I feel like this VNL, we're going to learn a lot. There's going to be a lot of younger players who get opportunities. We're going to see how the national teams are gelling together after a couple of years. Really looking forward to that. Uh, Agreed. It's been so long since we've been able to talk about national teams, uh, which I just love so much. And Europe has a phenomenally big year. You have VNL in a bubble in Italy. You have Tokyo, the Olympics, and then you have Eurovolley this year. So there's so much to cover about the European national teams all season long and you're right you're going to get a lot of younger players getting a lot of looks in vnl but those teams that are qualified for tokyo are going to have to start working towards that and then everybody's going to have to start working towards euro volley so we'll be talking a lot of a lot about all those things on this very show exactly and before we uh 
so guys, thank you for the questions. And yeah, let's uh, get into the special announcement uh, on today's show, which you might have seen on our channels are already, and that is that we are launching the Eurovolley 21 Ambassador Program starting today. And our, I'm going to be showing an interview I did with, uh, you probably could have guessed if you watched earlier, but Finnish setter uh, Amy Tervaporti, um, which we filmed earlier today. So he's going to talk about uh, his season with Yastrzemski Vegi. He'll give us some insight into Champions League and talk about Eurovolley 21, obviously. Um, so yeah, guys, follow our CV pages. We're going to be announcing one country per day. Each country has two ambassadors, and we're going to have uh, background stories. We're going to have extra picture and video content. And all the way up to Eurovolley 21, we're going to be interviewing these players. We're going to be talking with them. We're going to be uh, allowing them to talk with you guys in terms of Q&A. So we have a lot of really fun stuff planned. Uh, yeah, so check our pages out. Could be your favorite player is an ambassador this year. Um, so yeah, exciting stuff. Yeah, the idea of player-driven content is such a great idea. Uh, we've talked about before that we we would like the volleyball world to do a better job of showcasing our players and their personalities and who they are off the court. And what better of a way to do that than to get it straight from the source, uh, to get players from all these teams directly uh, producing things for you all to, to check out and learn who they are and what their lives are like preparing for these tournaments and all this really exciting stuff. I'm so excited about this, this program and to, to follow along with all of it. Yeah, and you guys are going to learn a lot about these guys by the time uh, August rolls around because we're going to be doing a lot of stuff with them. And, and check it out because uh, there's going to be some interactive content. So uh, if we're doing like an Instagram q and if we're going to do the European Volleyball Show, next time hopefully we'll have them live with us. And then, uh, yeah, we'd love to have you guys interact and, and go directly with the players because unfortunately that hasn't been able to happen a lot this year. So we're trying to uh, increase the interaction as best we can. Um, before I switch over to the interview, which is just going to be the video playing, um, I have to address one thing about, you know, I, uh, somebody talked about Jackson Howe in the comments, Trinity Western, <laughs> got to talk a little bit about it because he's Canadian, uh, but yeah, Jackson Howe's awesome, I think for sure he'll, he'll be a prospect on the national team going forward. The kid is in a walking Instagram highlight reel. For sure, for Absolutely sure. Absolutely unbelievable, like a, a shorter middle blocker, but jumps unbelievably high. Uh, does some ridiculous things, blocking and attacking. Um, I would love to see him get a look on the national team. I think that would be incredible. Fun to watch. All right. Thanks always, guys. I'm going to switch the interview now. Rob, thanks for joining us. And guys, stick around for the interview because there's some pretty interesting insight here on uh, Amy's season. All right. Hey, guys, we have a special guest for you guys today on the European Volleyball Show. Amy, you are our first ambassador of the Eurovolley ambassador program. Uh, you're representing Finland as one of the representatives uh, from your country for Eurovolley 21. Uh, how does that feel to be, you know, the face of, of, of your team this year? Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, of course, it's a, it's a big honor honor to be representing your your own country and and it's been a long time that we we had uh, or we could uh, host our own uh, europeans and um, it's a uh, it's a special feeling like uh, it's been like i've been over 10 years in national team and uh, now i now i have the chance to compete uh, at home awesome and yet how is that playing at home? When's the last time you've, you've played a major tournament in, in front of a home crowd like this? Right. I think we had some, uh, some qualifications in, uh, in Finland, but uh, we never had like a major like Europeans uh, or, or world championships at home at my time. Eh? And uh, I okay. think 93 was the last time we had uh, Europeans at home. Wow. Okay. So <laughs> quite a while. That's uh, that's great news then that, they can return to Finland. And then obviously it's still early. You guys are still very much in the midst of your club season. So definitely focused on that. But uh, what kind of preparations uh, are you guys planning on doing for Eurovolley this year? Yeah, I don't know. Like we have, we have some, uh, some rough, uh, rough plans already from the, from the Federation and from our coach. And, uh, and of course the plan is to, to be, as prepared as you can be in the when the when the Europeans start and uh, 
it's gonna be a lot of work in the in the three months before and uh, I hope we will be ready ready when uh, when we step on the court. So do you guys have a text group going, a WhatsApp group? Are you, are you chatting with your teammates fairly often and seeing how, how they're doing, either playing in Finland or I know you have teammates playing in Russia and I think maybe uh, Germany or France as well. Do you guys keep in contact during during the club season? Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, we, we are still like a small country and we don't have so many players abroad and, uh, and it's always, it's easier to follow because you don't have so many players outside and... Uh, and of course, it's it's really important for us that uh, that we have Finnish players outside and playing uh, playing some important roles and um, and yeah, this uh, this text text group we we I think every every week we are we are sending something and asking how you good how you doing and and just being aware that uh, how's the situation. Uh, so were you guys able to get together and practice at all last summer? I know a lot of teams uh, were not really able to do much. I think we we practiced. I, I didn't practice because um, I had to go back to Greece to finish the, the season still in, in July. And uh, so I wasn't part of the national team last summer. But uh, I think they had some camps, but not not much because of the situation. And also okay. because all, all these um, all these major tournaments were were cancelled and postponed, so so I don't think I think three weeks, four weeks they practiced. So there might be some young guys on the team who who got a lot better. Oh, wow, this guy grew a couple inches, or this guy gained uh, gained ten kilograms of muscle, or something. <laughs> uh, no, for sure, for sure, and uh, and uh, it's it's gonna be interesting to see, like because like. This kind of an uh, off year last year, you didn't uh, spend time so much together with the national team, and now, now it's gonna be really intensive summer with uh, with the guys. So I I think everybody is full of motivation and and wanting to to have the good results end of the summer. Yeah. So, Amy, you're the first of many ambassadors we have representing all the host countries for Eurovolley. So thank you so much. Uh, for being a part of this program. It's going to be a great tournament this year. Really looking forward to it. But it isn't the only tournaments uh, we're running this year. We also have the Champions League, which we're waiting for the Super Finals right now. I feel like this big month, is a, there's a lot of anticipation building. Um, have you been following the tournaments uh, very much? Yeah, I watched all the, all the quarterfinals, semifinals. Uh, also checked the results of the pool phase and... Um, and for sure, it's. I think uh, if you say it's a little bit surprised who is in the in the men's final, and uh, but seeing how they play, it's really deserved. Like uh, Zaksa is playing amazing volleyball right now, or in the in the Champions League, uh, beating Lupe, Lupe and Kazan to to be in the final. So that's for me really deserved. Also Trentino, who has really, really good individuals. And, uh, and they they beat Perugia, so that's that's for sure. They they are the the dessert finalists, and uh, it's gonna be for me really interesting match to see who's gonna take the take the trophy home. And do you do you do you guys kind of feel maybe a sense of pride or what or whatever to uh, have a Polish team from the Plus Liga, like in the Champions League Super Finals? Do you think that you know really speaks to the to the high level of the league this year? I think for sure, for sure, this uh, this shows that Plus Liga is one of the top top leagues in the world, and um, and showing that uh, we can also also compete against these uh, these big clubs. And um, yeah, I'm I'm really happy that they they have this this team in there, and uh, to show some uh, that if you play good, you deserve to be there. Well, it probably makes you feel a little better that you guys are not the only ones who have, <laughs> have struggled against uh, Kadzirs in this year. Because you have, yeah, like you said, teams like uh, teams like Lubic Ivtanova uh, being beaten by them, and uh, Zenit Kazan, two of you know, or two two of the teams that won Champions League the last few years. Um, but when you're watching the games this year, uh, any players that stand out? Maybe guys you you would want to play with that seem fun to play with. If if you 
well, I think from Zaksa, I have to say, say, say Menyuk, uh, he's been playing a really good season today, uh, this year, and um, uh, also Satorsky and uh, Tonyuti, who's been showing showing their level and uh, and uh, are the really important uh, uh, structures in the in the team. Also, if you have to say from Trentino, I would say Abdelaziz is uh, like he changed four years ago, three years ago, uh, the position to as an opposite, and uh, now already showing that he's one of the one of the best in the world. So I think these these are these are the guys that uh, that I like to watch right now. Yeah, there's some great players. There. Amy, have you uh, ever considered position switch? To uh, to no. opposite, no, we're not, no. We're, not get, no. <laughs> we're not getting any anytime soon. Yeah, that's it's pretty impressive that he was able to do that. But uh, you could still see like this year he, he was actually setting a couple times as well. So he, uh, yeah, he I think I that. think uh, because of COVID uh, he had to had to play as a setter and uh, he did he did for me. I watched the game and he did okay. Yeah, not bad. Like considering, in the, like, uh, like in the old years. old days, so. <laughs> Um, do you have any games that you watched this year that really stood out to you? I know this year it seemed like there were there were quite a few good ones, but is is there any one in particular that you can remember being excited by? I I think the second semi final in against okay, Saxa against Gazan was was really high level volleyball and, and and really I think one of the best games in this season. Yeah, it was great, you know, really back and forth. It seemed like any team could have taken it. Uh, fantastic games in Champions League this year. And if you guys don't know, probably heard it a thousand times, but Super Finals, May 1st, uh, Zach Sekadjic and Kojle versus Trentino. Going to be really fun. And now let's move on to our last topic of the day, Amy, because we haven't mentioned it yet, but Yastrebshi y- was, uh, was in Champions League, unfortunately, re- really unfortunately. You weren't able to participate in any games due to uh, uh, COVID restrictions, which for me as a fan, it was too bad because looking at how your team has done this year, uh, you know, amazing season so far. You guys are in the Plus League of Finals, second place in the regular season. Um, how- how's the season going so far? Well, the season is, his season is going really good. Like, I think the only only minus or negative thing was that we couldn't participate on the on the Champions League because we had uh, we had uh, some COVID cases uh, just before the for the tournaments and uh, yeah, then you cannot uh, cannot participate. So that that was a bummer. But uh, yeah, in the in the league in the league we were second in the in the Polish Cup and now. Now on Wednesday we just uh, qualified for the for the final of the Plus Liga, so we are just waiting uh, on Sunday. The Zaksa and uh, Belhat of they will play the third game for the decider who is who is coming with us to the to the final. So yeah, I would say it's uh, it's been a really really good year until now. Yeah, and a, a couple of questions based on that. Uh, how is the series against Versava, which I thought was a pretty strong team, but it seemed like you guys. Uh, took care of them fairly comfortably, I would say. Uh, I, I wouldn't say comfortably, but uh, they have they have really really good team, and we had to to give our best to to win these games. And uh, and uh, I think uh, in the end, our our strength was that we had uh, we had some players that uh, could come out from the bench and uh, and uh, change the game and uh, help the team to to be a little bit better than the the opponent and. Um, I think I think this has been the strength of our of our team the whole year that uh, or the whole season that uh, we have been able to play all with all the fourteen players that we have in the team. And you mentioned the match, the third. So for those who don't know, uh, Belshazov and Kazuyus and Kozle are playing a best out of three series in the semifinals. They are one game apiece, playing the third match on Sunday at I believe two forty five, uh, CET. Were you a little surprised, Amy, that uh, Belshatov was able to take that series to three just because Kedzirish and Kojli has been so dominant this year? And, and Belshatov, I, I believe, was, what, sixth, sixth place in the or fifth place in the regular season? Fourth place. Fourth place, okay, sorry. Yeah, but yeah, 
for sure, for sure. Seeing the earlier results of uh, of Zaxa and uh, how good had they been in 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 this uh, in in this league or the whole se- through the whole season, they for sure small small surprise. But uh, then when you watch Belhatov and you watch the players and you have some quality there also. Like it's for me that's also shows how how high level these games are. And uh, however the teams are in the um, uh, in the plus liga and uh, and this this kind of happens and this is also playoffs and uh, you never know what happens. Yeah, for sure. And and you don't have to answer this if you don't want to. But uh, do you have any preference of who you want to play in the finals? No, not really. Okay. I don't. <laughs> if you want to win gold, can... you have to beat everybody. So. So we will we will see on Sunday who's, who will who will be playing with us and uh, then we will make the analysis and everything and be prepared uh, for for the best match possible. Yeah, well, I'm very much looking forward to it. For any people watching that only watch Champions League, definitely try and check out the uh, Plus Liga finals as well because it's if you enjoy high level volleyball, it's right up there with the best in the world. And the, kind of the last question I had for you here today is. You know, I feel like it was a bit of a tough start to the season. You had, uh, you know, like we said earlier, the COVID cases, a couple injuries, a coaching change. Was there any, uh, you know, moments or game moments in the locker room where you guys came together and like, okay, let's uh, turn this around. Let's let's start uh, winning games. Well, I, for me personally, I don't. I I really didn't see that we had uh, any crisis in the team or any any moments. Okay, we had some. Uh, had some bad games in the beginning of the uh, of the 2021, but uh, right. I think we knew what we were doing and uh, just being patient and, and trusting uh, what you can do and what you can give to the team. And uh, and as a team, I think our like the team spirit and this is is really good in, inside of the team. And um, and. Uh, like I said, we have 14 players uh, who can play, and uh, the practice are really competitive and uh, and uh, like pushing everybody to give their best every day. Great answer, and uh, yeah, good luck in the practice later today. Good luck in the Plus Liga finals, and good luck with Euro Volley 21, another competition that I think we're all really looking forward to. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye.